A single cubic centimeter of air on Earth contains 20 billion billion. You currently have about 7 times 10 to the 27th power inside you. These tiny things that make up all the matter around us, and in staggering quantities, are atoms. They're everywhere. And yet, even though we spend our entire lives in their company, no one had ever managed to observe them directly until very recently. As you may have guessed, today we're going to do our best to get as close as possible to the immensely fascinating reality of these ridiculously tiny objects, and to go meet them and realize the staggering distance that separates us from them. Let's start, thanks to this short video made by Conseil Européen pour la Recherche Nucléaire, by diving toward one of those that help make up our hair. And here we are, entering inside a cell made up of macrofibers, which themselves are made up of a tangle of microfibers, which themselves are made up of even smaller fibers, which get their shape from long keratin proteins themselves, formed by molecules. Interlocking amino acids made up of atoms of sulfur, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, or even hydrogen. The simplest things in terms of atoms in the universe, and to represent these atoms, we often use this kind of image. With the nucleus in the center made up of neutrons and protons, around which electrons revolve, calmly moving within stable orbits. This representation, known as the planetary model, although convenient, is obviously incorrect. This is absolutely not an atom. Atomic particles are not tiny point-like balls that are relatively close to each other. In reality, this model is thrown away along with the trash itself. And that's for two reasons. The first is the enormous size of atoms compared to the size of their components. Consider that the nucleus is a hundred thousand times smaller than the atom itself. To put it another way, if you increase the size of the nucleus's components so that it was one millimeter, then, proportionally, the electrons would be whirling around nearly a hundred meters away. Which means that 99.9999999999999% of the volume of these objects is made up of empty space. There is so much empty space inside each atom that if all of humanity had the good idea to gather in the same place, then, right after, the other good idea to compress themselves until all the empty space between the elements making up our atoms is filled. Then, all the matter making up humanity would fit into a volume the size of a die, a die weighing 500 million tons. Just a quick note, if it reassures you, this experiment, as deadly as it is absurd, cannot be carried out. Because the repulsive forces that govern the behavior of matter at these scales would prevent us from bringing the particles that make up atoms so close together. But are some stars, known as neutron stars or white dwarfs, made of matter that has undergone this kind of compression? But enough digression. The second reason why this model needs to be shattered may also be even more important. It relates to the fundamental nature of subatomic particles. Because when we cross the symbolic boundary of about a tenth of a nanometer, we find that the behavior of matter, its movement, does not correspond at all to what the world around us has accustomed us to. To accurately represent the behavior of electrons around the nucleus, we would need to depict them frenzied, elusive, whirling around extremely quickly and at a level that's hard for us to even imagine. Because even when calm, under ordinary conditions, an electron makes on average 6.6 .6 times 10 to the 15th revolutions per second around the nucleus, which gives it a speed of about 2,400 kilometers per second. This insane speed, which would allow you to make a round trip from Marseille to Brussels in less than a second, is also relatively negligible since it doesn't even reach 1% of the speed of light. In reality, electrons do not actually rotate. It doesn't actually orbit the nucleus, strictly speaking, like our satellites orbit our planet. When we talk about speed here, we're using the edge representation model, which is partly there to keep beginners like me from losing it and to help us picture it. Actually, it would be more accurate to swap the idea of speed for that of energy level. And above all, to emphasize that at these scales, the very behavior of particles basically blows up the idea of having a precise position. In reality, as strange as it may seem, electrons are non-point-like, dimensionless particles whose speed and position cannot both be known at the same time. If you want to know more about these oddities, I refer you to that episode. 
And then, at these atomic scales, matter and particles exhibit behavior that is intrinsically wave-like in nature. In other words, electrons can behave both like particles and like waves. And to represent this peculiarity, to do justice to this new layer of complexity. Rather than talking about particles, a term that implies electrons have a well-defined position. It would be more accurate to be closer to their bizarre reality, to represent them as wave functions, as diffuse electron clouds. It should be noted that these clouds are not a perception of electrons, of which we would only see the trace in the wake of their passage. Too fast for us to distinguish them precisely. Electrons themselves occupy all the space through their electronic wave functions, or clouds. This may be the best we have to represent it in a visually acceptable language for our brain. The blurry regions inside which there is a greater or lesser probability of finding electrons. When we try to study atoms with our instruments, it's inside these misty volumes with fuzzy edges that electrons appear. As if the cloud contracted, suddenly shrinking into a particle and making its appearance. Here or there, its position changing each time within the blurry boundaries. From the cloud to the particle, from the particle to the cloud to the particle, to the cloud to the particle. These regions where electrons can appear are called atomic orbitals. They do justice to the wave-like behavior of matter and show the areas within which electrons preferentially appear as particles and randomly when we try to study them. Here, we must stress a highly unusual feature of reality at the nanoscale. In these orbitals, electrons are literally everywhere at once. They are at all possible points at the same time, truly occupying all the space, as if they were spread out there until we try to find out where they are. In fact, these orbitals can be seen as maps of possibilities. Territories that the electrons occupy, but within which the density of habitation. The probabilities of presence fluctuate and evolve depending on the regions, and when we try to study them, these orbitals do not represent all possible electron locations. Because, due to their strange quantum property, there is always a non-zero probability that they will appear just about anywhere around the atom. In other words, when there are no disturbances, electrons are entirely these orbitals, orbitals caught in the mesh of a web whose shape and energy levels are constrained and partly guided by at the center, the nucleus acts like a kind of invisible electric net, extending its influence to the very edges of the atom. We know the shapes of these electron clouds through equations, but also through experiments and by multiplying measurements on a particular atom. By accumulating data, we can see electrons appearing preferentially in certain regions, to the point where, little by little, we end up drawing, just like a pointillist painter would. Clouds formed by accumulated points, whose blurry and diffuse boundaries mark the statistical limits of the electron's extension. Depending on their energy level, the configurations of their orbitals create hallucinated flowers in a bestiary of extremely varied shapes. What you're currently seeing on the screen are all the possible configurations of electron clouds for the simplest atom in the universe, hydrogen. An atom consisting of only one proton around which a single unique electron moves. You can see here that at the lowest energy levels, the electron appears in an almost spherical orbit. But very quickly, as the energy level increases, new shapes of orbitals, new wave functions appear. Double spheres, lobes that are more or less rounded and numerous, symmetrical, or even surrounded by a belt. In fact, the shape of the orbitals. These statistical limits on freedom of movement give us the dimensions of the small prisons in which the wave functions of each electron are confined. And if these prisons have such well-defined volumes and shapes, it's because at the atomic scale, we observe that electrons, if they are sufficiently excited, can suddenly jump to a higher energy state, and thus see the shape of their orbital change abruptly to take on another one. At these scales, things occur as if the permitted shapes are discontinuous. And electrons can only move from one energy level to another abruptly, with none possible in between. At this level of reality, things are quantized. A wave function can only take certain forms, while others are intrinsically impossible for it to have. In short, the constituents of atoms evolve in a discontinuous universe, a universe of stepwise values. 
and so it is the possible combinations of the so-called quantized properties of electrons that will give the petals, these orbitals, their shape. And just to add a bit more color to this complexity, we can wonder how all this comes together in atoms heavier than hydrogen, surrounded by swarms of interacting electrons. Well, roughly speaking, it becomes a mess every time we add a proton to the nucleus and an electron around it. The electric field strength, like cloud shapes, evolves and changes. And the configuration of these hallucinated flower petals becomes even more varied as it becomes the product of several orbitals that sort of fit together. Because by adding electrons to the group, we don't just stack the electron shells on top of each other, but rather inside each other. So, you can have atoms with dozens, sometimes hundreds of electrons, whose orbitals are nested within each other. It's this ability to literally interpenetrate that makes the size of atoms not change much as their number of electrons increases. In fact, if electrons were stacked, like the layers of onions do, a gold atom with its 79 electrons should be at least 10 times bigger than a carbon atom, which only has six. But in reality, gold atoms are only twice as big as carbon atoms. Because these 79 orbitals are all about the same size and interpenetrate each other like clouds mixing together. That's why adding protons and neutrons to the nucleus and electrons around it only slightly increases the size of an atom. Although it significantly changes its properties. And to fully realize the range of possible shapes, we should also mention the Pauli exclusion principle which, without going into detail, requires that in each orbital, one out of every two electrons must adopt a different configuration. Strangely, in this joyful mess, a bit of simplicity starts to show itself. Because the ability of atoms to bond with each other, their degree of affinity, is largely determined by the electrons in the outermost shell of the nucleus. They make up the main dictionary from which the possible chemical interactions between atomic elements are written. Elements that, in order to stick together, attach and bond with each other to form molecules, simply share their electrons. And conversely, it is these and their orbitals that give matter its identity. They tell it how to behave. Whether it should be liquid, gaseous or solid, metallic, insulating, hard, soft, have a certain color, be shiny or transparent. That accounts for almost everything. In short, they are the reason why a carbon atom, whether it comes from you, a block of graphite, or an oyster, has the same properties. And I think it's pretty cool to realize that if, right now, on the other side of the universe, aliens are taking science classes, then they are necessarily studying the same atomic elements as we are, because these are in the cosmos, everywhere we look, identical. Compared to the introduction, you may now think this is a scam. Since the beginning of this episode, I've only shown you artistic or scientific representations and simulations of the shape of atoms. But have we ever actually managed to see them for real? Well, in a way, yes. Because these orbitals can be indirectly redrawn by studying the color of the light re-emitted by electrons, which allows us to trace their shape. In reality, it's more complex than that, but you understand the basic concept. Here, you see in two dimensions the visual interpretation of data indirectly collected by a team of Swedish researchers, who in 2008 managed to capture the changes over time of the orbitals of an atom. With a lower degree of precision, we are also able to detect the presence of atoms using very special microscopes called scanning tunneling microscopes. You are currently seeing, magnified 100 million times, the arrangement of atoms observed with one of these microscopes on the surface of a crystal. As for this film that you are currently seeing on the screen, it was made by a team from International Business Machines and is considered to be the smallest animated film in the world. You can see atoms being moved one by one using a scanning tunneling microscope. And by taking successive snapshots, the researchers managed to create this stop-motion cartoon. Here, each little ball in the image is an oxygen atom, and the waves, the small oscillations surrounding them, reveal to us the quantum nature of electrons. Until very recently, this type of image was the best we could do to see atoms. Until physicist Aneta Stodolna found a clever way to, let's say, photograph the shadow cast by the hydrogen wave function. And here's what she got. This kind of grainy spot is absolutely fascinating. This is the first so-called direct observation of the inside of an atom. 
More precisely, it shows us the distribution in space of the wave function of the electron in a hydrogen atom. In a very highly excited state and the variations in the density of its electron cloud. And yet, as striking as this photograph is, having immortalized one of those little things that make all the big ones, it ignores one aspect of atomic reality that may remain forever visually inaccessible to us. Because, intrinsically embedded in every electron, there is a property that can only take certain values. A quantized property called spin makes them into confusing magnet-like entities, which aren't truly magnets. And they can only indicate, all in all, just two directions. Any attempt to represent electrons on paper faces a nearly insurmountable limit. How can we hope to draw or try to picture a particle with no volume, no size, yet with a tiny mass and spinning on itself, even though, strictly speaking, it isn't really spinning? And there you have it. After twisting our minds with electrons that can't actually spin, we'll stop here. I did my best to show you an atom, but even by simplifying things a lot, I think I failed. Those little things are still too big for me to handle. Next time, I'll just make you a doodle. In the meantime, I leave you with a heavy heart. Like their core, inside which we discovered that protons and neutrons are also made up of smaller particles. Quarks. These elements, 10,000 times smaller than the nucleus itself, are for now the best example of something ridiculously small. Their limit actually makes us humans true giants. Because... In terms of size, you are a hundred times more imposing to a quark than the distance between you and the star closest to the sun is to you. It's incredible to realize that this amazing territory to explore is right here, around and inside us. And what if you want to dive into the history of atoms before they were on Earth, in the stars that made them, before they ended up inside you? I created two videos sharing their amazing story. Links below and follow my Instagram.